Welcome, welcome, welcome to Ben Church. In this season of Eastertide where we celebrate resurrection every single week. And here we believe that every human being is a beloved child of God. And wherever you are on your journey in faith, you're more than welcome. You are affirmed and loved here at Ben Church. If you were in the building, you would see that we are celebrating resurrection every week by, uh, with flowers and butterflies, and it's a beautiful space to be in. So I invite you to come on down if you feel comfortable. Um, we will continue to mask while we are worshiping in the sanctuary, but the rest of the building is open to take off masks if you feel comfortable with that. I am Senior Pastor Jen Stewart, and some of our online worship experience is going to be shifting as we move towards um, creating beautiful music here in the building and less worrying about the music online. So I apologize for those of you who are staying at home, but um, we've got to use our resources wisely. In this season of Eastertide, as we celebrate spring and resurrection, we also note that today we celebrate Earth Day when we look towards how important the Earth, our home, is and how we must take care of it. So I invite you to uh, center yourself, maybe take a deep breath in. And let us pray for the earth and for all of creation on this day. Lord, we know that there is a climate crisis happening and it calls for our urgent repentance and conversion. We are beckoned to rediscover a biblical vision and a new understanding of ourselves and of your creation. The only future foreshadowed by the present crisis, both spiritual and ecological, is massive suffering, both human and non-human. And so we pray, giver of life, sustain your creation is our prayer. We pray it without ceasing. Creator, we know that we disfigure your world. Lord, have mercy. Redeemer, we reject your redemption and crucify you daily. Christ, have mercy. Giver of life, we too often choose death. Lord, have mercy. Creator, forgive us for our sins against you and your creation. In your name, may we turn from our sins and work toward a new creation, one in which all creatures are freed from the bondage of greed and accumulation and are able to flourish in their own creatureliness. May this church be a site of redemption, resilience, and hospitality, an extension of your love to all who are affected by this climate crisis. In this land, in this structure, in this community, in this worship, may we love you more fully by seeking justice for our neighbors. And all of God's creation says, amen. Let it be so.
The scripture reading this morning is from the book of Exodus, chapter 16, verses 1 through 10. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the Sin Desert, which is located between Elam and Sinai. They set out on the 15th day of the second month after they had left the land of Egypt. The whole Israelite community complained against Moses and Aaron in the desert. The Israelites said to them, Oh, how we wish that the Lord had just put us to death while we were still in the land of Egypt. There we could sit by the pots, cooking meat, and eat our fill of bread. Instead, you've brought us out into this desert to starve this whole assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to make bread rain down from the sky for you. The people will go out each day and gather just enough for that day. In this way, I'll test them to see whether or not they follow my instruction. On the sixth day, when they measure out what they've collected, it will be twice as much as they collected on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to the Israelites, This this evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the the Lord's glorious presence, because your complaints against the Lord have been heard. Who are we? Why blame us? Moses continued, The Lord will give you meat to eat in the evening, and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord heard the complaints you made against him. Who are we? Your complaints against us aren't against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole Israelite community, Come near to the Lord, because he has heard your complaints. As Aaron spoke to the whole Israelite community, they turned to look toward the desert, and just then, the glorious presence of the Lord appeared in a cloud. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Susan. I love this story. The people are so dramatic. It's like, like when I had teenagers in the house. Oh my gosh, we can't eat this. Oh. All right, so y'all look so good out there. Are, do you love the people you're sitting next to? Are you feeling good? Yeah, well, guess what? I have some news for you. This section of the congregation has been hit by Hurricane Ava. Your homes are gone. You have to move. You gotta get up. You gotta get up and move somewhere. You have no choice, sorry. It's been a hurricane. Hurricane, your homes are gone. You can just move over one, okay? I'm not gonna. (laughs) All right, uh, good. Look at that. We're awake. All right, nobody's gonna fall asleep yet. Uh, There are a group of you who are traders and explorers, and you like to just move. You like to see the world. So everybody with a watch on, I invite you to get up and move because you are moving across the world to explore. Everybody with a watch on. People at home can't do this, but I'm telling you, a lot of people aren't even here. All right, uh, there's a group of you who have lost your jobs. I'm so sorry, you lost your job, you can't pay for your mortgage, Um, your kids are hungry, you have got to go move in with your parents who live on the other side of the country. So everybody with black shoes on, move, sorry. Okay, I have really scary news for you guys. Um, 
um, the bishop has called and uh, you are, there are death threats against you and you are frightened, you need to leave immediately, you have got to get out of the country. And so everybody with gray hair, violence in uh, your town. Some gangs have moved in and they're trying to get you to join. And if you don't leave, you're going to have to join this gang and do all kinds of terrible things. So everybody under the age of 50, you got to move. Now I want you to imagine that you are looking at a map of the world, okay? You know how you see it. We always see North America right here. North is up, right? Why is North up? It's only by convention that North is up. There's no scientific reason why North is any more up than South. Equally, we could do East is up or West is up or any other compass bearing point could be up. But that is how we see the world. The world, like a ball, has no top. We can look at it from any point of view. Top is a matter of habit and convention and emphasis. And no single map that you look at can give you a full picture of our amazing planet, this beautiful planet that we live on. But if you look at the world from one, only one vantage point, you risk missing so much. So let's think about your family history. Why did your family move here to Central Oregon? Anyone? Job? Y'all, I know y'all. What? No rain. No rain? <laughs> right? Retirement? Yes. Bring us to a beautiful place. Well, I was, I'm sure I've told you this before, I was born in Georgia because my mother was in the army, she was on an army base. And, but back in the day, you got kicked out of the army for having children, so she immediately moved to Miami, Florida, where her family was, and, and raised me and my sister there till we were about, I was almost 13 when we, when we left. And we left because in 1980, there were 573 murders that year in Miami, Florida, Dade County. In 1981, there were 621 murders in Miami, Florida. So my family left Miami because they felt it was a dangerous place to raise two little girls and because my father was lucky enough to get a job in Houston, Texas. So we moved to the suburbs of Houston. And uh, when we uprooted our family to move to the Pacific Northwest, it was because we wanted a better life for our children than, than the political situation that was happening in Texas, but also because I got a job. <laughs> That's why we moved. See, migration of groups, of large groups of people have happened throughout human history. This is a part of being human. There is nothing new about it. And most people who are migrating are looking for a better life, a safer life, a place to raise their children, a place to find work and live in peace. Well, in our story today from the book of Exodus, which I just, I love this story, we have the Israelites leaving Egypt. But why were they there in the first place? Do you remember that story? There'd been a famine. And Joseph, you remember Joseph, amazing Technicolor dream coat, Joseph. He was kind of a brat, and uh, well, he was more than a brat because his brothers sold him into slavery. Like, I think that's next level brattiness if your family's ready to sell you into slavery. And uh, he ends up in Egypt, long story short, he has dreams of the future, and they always, they always turn out, and he ends up working for the Pharaoh. And he tells the Pharaoh in, in one of his dreams that, and in scripture, dreams are always something that God has given you. God has told him that there's going to be a famine and they need to plan for it. 
And Pharaoh is so impressed with Joseph that he hires him. And Joseph becomes, you know, a huge muckety-muck in Egypt. And as it turns out, his family that had sold him into slavery ends up coming to him looking for help, right? Looking to escape the famine, because Egypt is the only place that is actually saved up for this famine. And so all the Israelites, his family, from where they were, come and end up in Egypt. And some generations later, they find themselves in slavery, as often happens in the history of the world. But they came for a better life. That's why they came. So in our story today, remember Moses has taken the people out of slavery. They've been out for about 45 days is what the scriptures tell us. And they are in an an oasis in the uh, wilderness called Elam. Uh, And there's water and there's palm trees and they're thinking maybe we should stay here for a while. But God is, is, is pulling them on. No, we can't stay here. And, and that's when they start to get a tad dramatic. Oh, how we wish that the Lord had just put us to death while we were still in the land of Egypt. There, we could at least sit by the pots cooking meat and eat our fill of bread. And instead, you brought us out into this desert to starve this whole assembly to death. Praise God. <laughs> See, they'd already lost their perspective. 45 days, they've already lost their perspective. They were slaves. And their negativity instinct won out. Again, I'm still reading this book, Factfulness. So, <laughs> and it talks about how humans have this instinct to be negative, to, to forget the past and to see things only in very current terms. And so a, a little reminder In 1800, 193 out of the 194 countries that were uh, around at that time uh, allowed slavery, forced labor. Now only three countries around the world have forced labor, slavery. In 1800, 44% of the children born across the world did not live to see their fifth birthday, 44%. In 2016, that number is 4%. It's good news. In 1850, 148 countries had smallpox outbreaks. Killed hundreds of thousands of people for long periods of time. In 1977, with the last person to get smallpox was in uh, Somalia. It was wild uh, smallpox. And uh, what happened was the, the, everyone was vaccinated. They, they kept this guy by himself. His name was Ali. And he dedicated his life to making sure that people got vaccinated. There have been no smallpox outbreaks since then. Nobody has died from small, smallpox, something that used to kill us in, in broad, huge numbers. Perspective is shaped by our negativity instinct. Notice the bad more than the good. Again, a quote from my buddy Hans Rosling. For centuries, older people have romanticized their youth and insisted that things ain't what they used to be. Well, that's true, but not in the way they mean it. Most things used to be worse, (laughs) not better. As someone who grew up in Miami, I can say this. But it is extremely uh, easy for humans to forget how things really used to be. In Western Europe and North America, only the very oldest who lived through the Second World War or the Great Depression have any personal recollection of this severe deprivation and hunger of just a few decades ago. And even in China and India, where extreme poverty was the reality for the vast majority of of people just as, as, as uh, close as 1966. It is now mostly forgotten by the people who live in decent houses and have plain clothes and ride bulkheads everywhere. There was this study um, that a Swedish author and journalist, Lassi Berg, he wrote this excellent report from rural India in the 1970s. 
And when he returned there 25 years later, he could see clearly how the living conditions had improved. And the, the pictures from his visit in the 1970s showed earthen floors and clay walls and half-naked children and the eyes of villagers with low self-esteem and little knowledge of the outside world. This was in stark contrast to the concrete houses of the late 1990s where well-dressed children played and self-confident and curious villagers watched television. And when Lassie showed the villagers the 1970s pictures, they couldn't believe the photos were taken in their neighborhood. No, they said, that, that can't be here. You must be mistaken. We've never been that poor. 25 years. Like most people, they were living in the moment, busy with new problems like the children watching immoral soap operas <laughs> or not having enough money to buy a mo motorbike. Beyond living memory, for some reason, we avoid reminding ourselves and our children about the miseries and brutalities of the past. Does that sound familiar? We have short memories. It's why Christians take part in Holy Week, to remember the suffering and our complicity. It's why our Jewish friends hold seders and they remember the Passover and how God protected them. And it's why so many of us don't want to hear about black history now. Why so many of us are learning things now we never heard about. And it's why I'm reminding you today that all of us in this room were migrants at some point in our past. Like the Israelites, God has brought us to a place flowing with milk and honey. Or kombucha and beer. <laughs> I really like the kombucha. But regardless, also like the Israelites, we forget what gifts God has blessed us with. Good weather, water, food, good company. And not only is it our duty to appreciate these gifts, it is our duty to make sure that others can share them, those who come behind us. If we do not take care of the earth to the best of our abilities, there will be nothing good left. In the book, Factfulness, the one large global problem that is not getting better due to technology, although there is better gas, there are some things we are doing better. But the one uh, thing that everybody agreed on, uh, when I told you last week about the, the questions that he put out, um, is that their global warming is a fact. Global warming is happening. Global warming is our fault. Science tells us this. And I know that there are those who, who don't want to acknowledge this issue, but the facts speak for themselves. No one has complained mightily about our late snow this year as late as last Saturday as we were decorating and snowing madly outside. We're, we were not complaining about that because we know we're going to need it when fire season kicks in during the late summer. And those of you who have lived in the Pacific Northwest know fire season isn't a, a, a naturally occurring 30, 25 years ago. That wasn't something that happened every year. And now we know to expect it. And now we pray for rain and snow earlier in the year. God calls our churches and our homes not only to be places of, of hospitality for those we know and love, but also for our new neighbors, those who are forced to move or migrate due to reasons of persecution or disaster. The climate crisis is driving main migration around the world. And as weather patterns become more erratic, bringing drought to some areas and flooding to others, people are forced from their land and community to find refuge in other places. And these migrants who are expected to number in the hundreds of millions in the next century do not have the same protected status of refugees because their situation does not meet the definition of persecution, at least in our country. And this makes it easier for countries to reject environmental migrants from the border. 
Now, historically, the church has played a huge role in ensuring just policies and welcoming spaces for migrants. Although we are often torn apart by the politics of immigration, as Christians, it is up to us to remember the story that we are rooted in, that we were once migrants, that we were once not welcome. And so as we move into a new future, as we make political decisions about how we welcome or do not welcome people into this country and other countries around the world, I invite you to root yourself in our scriptures rather than our political parties. This is not just an international problem either. We already in the United States have a tribe, the Biloxi, Chichimaca, Choctaw Band of Indians on the Isle de Jean Charles in Louisiana. They are the first group of climate displaced people here in the United States. More internally displaced people are expected to be forced out of their homes along the coast or in wildfire risk areas. Someday, maybe us even. So as we grow as a community of faith, as we think about these things that are affecting us right now, just as they affected our ancestors thousands of years ago, let us be a faith community that can be a hub of hospitality for our neighbors, welcoming them with love and generosity. Always we remember the words of Jesus. Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. So politicians across, <laughs> across all the lines would invite us to turn against our migrant neighbors. And in fact, if you look at next door, <laughs> the next door app online, you might think that people in Bend hate everyone who moves here, even if they are from this country. This cannot be our posture, though. We are followers of Jesus. So let us follow Jesus into dangerous territory, inviting those whom others do not want to our tables. And though we may inwardly whine, <laughs> that we must share this beautiful land. Let us not allow the political world to divide us. We are people shaped by the biblical story. And those stories are ones of migration and chagrin, miracles and hope. Let's be the miracle for other people. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all. Amen. The Word always calls us to respond, and if part of your response is to want to learn more about this congregation and getting involved, I invite you to email me at jen.benchurch at gmail.com, and I would love to get to know you and tell you about all that is going on at Ben Church. And if also you are called to respond by um, sending in uh, money to sustain the work that we do here, I invite you to do so. You may Venmo us at Ben Church. You may send in a check to this address, or you may go to our website and use e-offering. All of these ways we can accept the gifts that you send to us and so that we can use that to bring about the kingdom of God right here on earth. And now I invite you to receive this benediction with love in your hearts. May the God who loves all creation, even the snakes and the snails and the scary things, and Jesus, who opens our eyes and ears and hearts, and the Holy Spirit, who shows her love in unexpected ways, go with you, dwell among you, and bring you courage. 
Go in peace, my friends. Amen.